Hello everybody, welcome along to a new edition of The Good, The Bad and The Rugby. There is so much happening in sport right now, the Euros are up and running. I hope you're enjoying that kind of thing. Um, we've got the Lions, not far away. But we have also got the climax of the Gallagher Premiership rugby season. We've got two belting semi-finals to look forward to, Bristol Quinns, Exeter against Sale. Uh, and we've got one of the key protagonists in the rugby this weekend as our special guest in a few moments' time. Uh, Tins is here. Hoff is here. How are you both? How are you, Tins? Good, thanks. Yeah, a little little jaunt down to Devon in the sun for this weekend. Uh, Good. It's, lady, it's lady's birthday, so that was nice. Just a, a sans les, les enfants, so that was always lovely. Um but yeah, and then went up to see my my dad today. It was his birthday. So Happy first birthday! I've seen him in about six months. Uh, did a few things with the BBC around interviewing him around his Parkinson's and a bit of an awareness type thing, but also a nice little catch up uh, with with him, which I, I haven't seen very. You know, I've seen him t- twice or three times in the eighteen months that this whole thing's been going on. So it was nice. Very nice. What did you get him for his birthday? Uh, it's it's tricky he doesn't want anything so then my mum who can't describe what he wants or what he needs sometimes she sort of stuck, said he needs some trousers so I was like okay you need to put a little bit more detail on that and, and I still haven't got to the bottom of it but there is going to be some sort of he needs some sort of get up some flares he, mix it up a because bit get proper orange got... 1970 flares <laughs> Obviously, having Parkinson's spillage is quite hefty in his thing, so he needs hard wearing trousers that are easily cleanable. But uh, right. get him a uh, pair of yeah. waders. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> actually, that'd be more practical. Uh, or, just sit, just or, pour, or those, pouring crap on him. What about um, those yellow slick skin things that like people work by the seaside or lighthouse people wear? We just get spl- southwesters. Just roll a bright orange pair of them. Amazing. I'm, I'm definitely going to look at that. Was that nice? Did you have a big, a big, big old hug and a sort of? Yeah, it must have been quite, quite Every nice. time I try and hug him, he's obviously quite hunched now with his pockets, so I try and squeeze him to straighten him up. Right, but he, he doesn't really enjoy it, but um, it makes me feel I'm getting somewhere with him. Good, but yeah, oh, no, I, 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 look, see him. I hope that was yeah everything it should have been. Look, when's that out on the beat? Yeah. Is that a breakfast? Uh, I'm not sure yet. It will be yeah, but I'm not sure when it's to, when it's been done yet. Good on you. We'll keep our eyes peeled on that. Hoffingtons, any excitements? Any dramas? <laughs> Not really. Uh, no dramas. Good. Uh, two weeks, three weeks of no drama, which is always that's dangerous. Good. That's, that's got a long run for you. Brewing. That's, that's, an improve, that's, that's like an eight-game winning run. My new policy of never applying to people. I've been told to kill myself a couple of times recently, and I decided I won't. I won't. I won't respond. And we, do you know what? I feel so much better. I don't actually. I don't actually. <laughs> Yeah, that was by my wife. Um, no, but really good. I a shot, a, a, a shot in another competition on Sunday it was pretty awful. But every day is a school day, so that was great. Um, and I was actually at Soho Farmhouse earlier, and Paul Doran Jones tried his very hardest to get me out of doing this show. He was like, "Come on, Hask, come on! They don't need you, mate. They don't need you. The show's better. Without you. Just have another, have a bit, have a bit." I was like, "Come on!" I was with Bertie. Bertie embarrassed himself. Is, is that why? Is, is that so why bad. you sent the message saying, I'm, uh, "Do we need all four of us? I'm happy to step yeah. out if you don't need it." He made, he made, he made me send it, and I was like, "No, I'm in." Um, no, I, I, so I took Bertie for the first time down there. It was all like families, so all great. Let him off the leaf one second. He leapt for those of you who haven't been there into the lake, the ornamental lake, yeah. chasing people around a boat, swimming around, shaking it. So I thought, okay, fine. It's a hot day. People will excuse that. Took him into the courtyard near gravel, standing there talking to Doz. I saw someone, I waved, and this, this waiter's gone, miss, miss, pointed, pointed. I turned around, and Bertie had dropped the biggest shit, <laughs> right? But, I, but I'm like, it wasn't even like a comedy, like, because all the people who go to Soho Farmhouse, most of them have sort of those novelty dogs, you know, they yeah. do the little pebbles. Like, Carry like them in a bag. <laughs> Carry them in a bag, or they're like ornamental. Bertie did a bigger crap than a horse. Honestly, <laughs> I had to call up JCB and get one in, because the thing is, I walked off and the guy was like, ah, and I hadn't seen it. And you could see everyone tutting. I hadn't seen it. I hadn't seen it. I was like, I didn't see it. And, but luckily I got such big hands. I basically put my hand in a bin liner. I had a, oh, I had a poo bag because I'm a responsible dog owner. Picked it up and managed to style it out. But it was, it, it, I, I suddenly dawned on me why you just don't take dogs around with you at all times. He, he, and then he jumped up on someone's back in a chair. I was talking to someone. He just put his paws <laughs> right on this guy's shoulder. And they were terrified. I was like, you are the worst dog in the history of the world. That's why he's out in the garden. 
I love that. But if you are going to hang out more and more at Soho Farmhouse, I think a little chihuahua that you can pop in your yeah. wallet is, is possibly more fitting and certainly much easier to handle. Yeah. And we'll probably get you more comments yeah. in the mail online, which we know how much you um, <laughs> you adore. Yeah. Um, let's part of that. So two things I want to touch on before we welcome in our special guest, one of which is great news and one of which is utterly, utterly desperate. Um, let's do the good news first of all, which is that our friend and colleague and pretty much the person who brings the kudos and the credibility to everything they're doing. Emily Scarrett has been awarded an MBE in the Queen's Birthday Honours List. I think it's no coincidence that she gets it mere months after starting the Good, the Scars and the Rugby. I think the MBE is more awarded, though, for services to rugby than podcasting. But well done to the grandmother-in-law, Tins. Highly deserved. Um, one of the all-time great I tell a, players, tell full really stop. Big lie. I could tell a really big lie, so I, I go on, it. try it. I, I, I didn't, I didn't. Sort of, oh. she's got if if you are, if you have got influence, I think you know, I wouldn't mind yeah. one of those, and I, I can I'd understand be, why Hask wouldn't. But one I'd for next year, perhaps. I'll be upskilling myself first. Be going, yeah, okay. Yeah. Be, <laughs> you, 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 I, you understand why I wouldn't want that? I, I, I'm living. No, well, you wouldn't be given one. I mean, there's no hope for you. Oh, but I, like, I wouldn't be given one. No, oh, yeah. I like to no. think that, you know, you know clean cut image and trying to keep you two on the straight and narrow is worthy of some sort of <laughs> regal reckoning. Um, just oh, on, on oh, Skaz, though. One thing... Go on. Well, I just wanted to say, obviously, as a part owner of, of this show and a production company that produces the good, the Skaz and the rugby, there has been some huge discrepancies to what happened. She has a show named after her. Yep. And now she's getting MBEs. Yep. I can't. I couldn't get one of them for love nor money. Only thing I can get without uh, without any sort of problem is a parking ticket, and <laughs> I don't have any. My name's not involved in any of this in this stuff. I, I, she is, she has transcended us to a level. I messaged but, her that. I said, look, congratulations, unbelievable. But you are so big time now. I don't even know what to do. Well, and even when when you take the good the scars the rugby to watch the women's Allianz Premier Fifteens final, she's working for BT and taking the cash rather than doing her own show. Right. I tell you what, if, if Her Majesty could have a quiet word about Emily's commitment to the cause when she's handing out the MBE, I think we'd be very grateful. In the meantime, well done to one of England's all-time greatest, full stop, um, on your MBE. It's very, very good to see, and it's thoroughly deserved. Um, a complete and utter gear change, but I do want to just also stop. And I mean, I don't know how the hell you get into this. There is the utterly desperate news that has been uh, announced this, this week. That at the weekend, the former Gloucester Centre, Jack Adams, um, lost his battle with cancer at the age of 34. He's got a wife and three young children left behind. Um, I mean, just no words, really. It's the kind of thing that stops you in your tracks. Um, I remember watching him and broadcasting his games, but since he was your teammate, and I don't really know how the hell you kind of put sense around something like this. But yeah, I mean, I don't really know what to say. I don't really know what to ask. But it's just yeah, the most I mean, utterly, utterly horrific news. But and uh, the, the speed of it in terms of basically you yeah. sort of only really let it go. You know, whether he, he let it go that he had cancer on, the, I think, on the Friday. Just because they knew it was at that desperate stage, I didn't. I didn't know about it. I know Morgs, Ollie Morgan, who were on a WhatsApp group. He knew about it. He informed us on uh, either Thursday or Friday. And then before you get a chance to do anything, I I send you guys a message about doing something, and then you get the 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 tragic news that he he's lost that battle. Um, you know he's. Nicknamed Ghost because he literally was the most opaque man on the planet. Um, um, but you know, he, he sort of, I think he was Gloucester 2005 to 2009. I think I, I came off for his first thing and he came on and played better than I did. Um, but then just kept getting those injuries. He did his ACL, didn't he? And he sort of spent most of his time sideline. But yeah, he was just a great lad. And then he went into, he, he coached at, um, he, co he was coaching local. There were a couple of local clubs, um, Hucklecoat and somewhere else. I think he was coaching at the moment. Three kids, one's ten months old. It's, um, yeah, it's just not what, uh, yeah, what, well, it wasn't really what I was ready for <laughs> on this weekend. But uh, yeah, and he will be sadly missed, and heart and soul is going out to his wife and his three kids and the rest of his family. Yeah. Yeah. 
Hask. And obviously, you know, there's a lot that's been said and a lot that's been some some great support called for by the RPA. And and I mean, in, in the most horrendous circumstances, the rugby community is doing what the rugby community so often does, which is hopefully making a real difference here. But from your perspective, I mean, I know you didn't actually know Jack that well, but this is this has hit you for six. You put that in the WhatsApp group. And what more can people do? Where can they go? How can they help? Yeah, I mean, look, obviously, this is a terrible situation. And, I, you know, as a, as a trusted restart as well, it was brought to my, my attention. You know, the family reached out. And I, I wasn't aware that, that he had children. I knew that he was he, his wife. I knew that he was... They were looking for some support post this this difficult time. And obviously, you know, in my personal life outside of rugby, people always send me stuff on social media. You know, there's always people in desperate situations around the world, always looking for for, for help. And and I, I very you know, I do what I can physically. I don't always go and repost stuff because where do you where do you stop? But I heard this story and I, and he's 34. I'm 36. You know, he play he played his R spirit, he played rugby, you know, like that. You know, there's you know, there's people who are there are you know. I said I'm 36, he's 34. Oh, you sorry, sort yeah. of have that kind of you have that kind of thing, and you hear it, and you're like, you know, I I'm worried about what you're doing on the weekend. You just take the stuff for granted, and for someone's you know life to be taken by such a cruel disease, you know, and we all know people have been affected by cancer. I know that the world is going through lots of stuff at the moment, but to have something like that happen so quickly, um, it just really affected me, and I. You know, we sat down as a, you know, as the, as the, the trustees and, the, and everyone involved and said, look, what can we do? And we, you know, the, the idea to put a, with a just giving page together to try to, to, to put some, you know, take some pressure off in this difficult situation. And that's still standing. The opportunity for anyone to donate even a pound would be hugely grateful. Um, and you can always tell the mark of a, of a man because everybody always speaks nice about people when they passed away. But the fact that so many people have reached out to say what a good guy what a lovely person what an incredible family man what an amazing dad what a great i mean so many of his from the players from his the team he coaches have contacted me saying what a great you know great person he was a great coach he was what a lovely guy he was um and i just think look i know there's plenty of big causes in the world but to leave three children and a wife it you know is awful and we need to do as much as we possibly can to help raise as much money as we can because it doesn't matter if you look at the token you think that's a great amount of money you know we're talking about you know support for for life and we you know to push it as high as we can so if you want to donate there's a link in my profile there'll be a link with these videos there's a link in my stories you guys will have it you can head over to the restart page you can head over to the rpa go to just giving and type in in in, in um jack adams and let's see if we can't do something to alleviate this horrificness um and try to make a difference. And as I said, I, I, you know, I'm not an over emotional person. I'm not. I'm not. You know, always involved in all this stuff. But this is just something that particularly got me because you know, 34. You, you're meant to be living your life. You're meant to be the cancers in the mind is what happens to you know older people. Not 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 someone who's 34 who's fit who, who does what he does. But unfortunately, it, it affects everybody: children, old people, young people, anyone. You know, some people don't even get the live started. And I just think it, you know, I think we should do what we can. Absolutely. Um, and I think we, we've we discussed doing something between ourselves as well, whether, I don't know how you got on with it, Tins, but if we can do a show at King's Home and the tenor ticket and every Gloucester fan piles in and, and we'll have a sing-song for Jack, we get Bristol fans to come up, the M5, and have a bit of a sing-song as well, then we should absolutely pull that together and we'll try and do it as quickly as we possibly can. Have you had any progress to that or not? Uh, well, I've basically been sat in the car all day, so I haven't no. really... I know Brownie said yes uh, at Gloucester. Sorry, Brownie, if I've outed you then, you haven't really cleared it. Well, let's, but, just, um, let's, let's get it done. Yeah. I mean, it's the sort of yeah. thing that you, um, we need to get on and do it. So he, he said yes, uh, absolutely, over the weekend. So I just need to put... We need to put some detail together on it. He will be very much missed. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, again, there aren't really any words other than let's all try and do as much as we possibly can. Um, let's remember him for the player and the good times that he had at Gloucester and at Bristol and with England Sevens, of course, and go well, Ghost. Um, I don't think there's much more you can say other than that. Um, not easy, and and hopefully we will help wherever we can to try and put something in the pot to um, to help his wife and his kids and all all the very best, all the love and support to them right now. Um, I should think it'll give something br uh, Bristol something pretty powerful to play for this weekend. And, and we'll sort of gently move on to the fact that it is, as we touched on earlier, the Premiership playoff semi-finals. Briz are going to host Quinns, while at uh, Sandy Park, the defending champions Exeter, will look to take a step towards retaining their crown. In their way, 
stand sales sharks and there are good weeks to do this and there are bad weeks to do this and then there's this week it is a very warm welcome to their director of rugby alex sanderson who we have been desperate to have on this show for a long old time how are you good it's probably the prime week isn't it for you boys um and to be fair like i've been i've been talking to ask about doing this for for years right ask so uh apologies for not making good on those on those promises but i am here now so well, and also, when I asked you, Alex, when I said to you, and this is why, this is what we're going to, we're going to peel away the layers in this show. You said to me, like, Matt, I'm not sure I've got too much to say. I was like, what do you mean? You're one of the most successful coaches, one of the most loved coaches. You've got, you're bringing walls in changing rooms. You're doing like bringing snakes. Mate. There's just, there's so much to you that I want to like, I don't want to break all the secrets because obviously I know you've got a premiership to win and a bit of mystique. But if we could just hear a little bit about it, because... Every player I've ever spoken to who's worked with you raves about you. We've got mutual friends who rave about you. There's there's more than just the good looks, and that's what we want to find out about today. He knows how to butter people up, doesn't he, Ask? He knows good. how to open you up. To open you up. That's good. Me. And if it weren't if it weren't for the fact that I know you're a um, what's the uh, what's the word without Careful. swearing? <laughs> yeah. Yes. All right. Well, I mean, where do you want to start about being about being the most loved? Um, yeah, I'm always good at waxing on a wrinkle about myself. But, um, there's no mystique. There is no mystique. There's no magic wand. It's not there. There's no hack in, in this game as well, you know. It's just a lot of graft, a lot of hard work, a lot of care, a lot of gathering as much information as you can. And the best coaches do that, you know, for a fact. Every time you speak to Nelly Jones, he comes away with a lot more than you do at those meetings most of the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I guess in that mould, I've been, I've been just trying to over the last fifteen years and not been playing, just trying to get as much as I can from as many people as I know and respect, and um, and and seeing where I can fit that kind of knowledge and that expertise into where it works. My missus, by the way, was um, and still is, I guess, a bit of an artist. She was a designer. Uh, by trade, and she, she, I, I keep quoting her in that good design borrows, but genius steals. So, if anything, I can see for miles because I've stood on the shoulders of other giants in that respect. Um, a lot of what I try and incorporate has been done before um, and will be done again, but it's using those bits of knowledge and those things that you think is going to work with a group you've got at the right time. There are so many things to talk to you about, and it's a, it's a fascinating place to start in in sort of how you got to where you are. Can, can I almost start with the here and now? I mean, one of the things that we were talk we wanted to talk to you about, and and sort of give you the accolade really, was that I don't think there are many coaches, certainly in rugby, who are as good at the halftime interview as you are. There are many things you've won. It's a small accolade from us to you, but you are the king of just letting the viewer have something when you speak into a microphone. And there are plenty out there who, who use it as an opportunity to say nothing and get out as quickly as they can. But with all that said and done, your interview at the end of the game on the weekend was um, was pretty raw. Was that considered? Was that heat of the moment? How's that gone down in the changing room? Uh, well, look, I, I, I'm a big believer in you can never be undone, undone by the truth. I've come out with a lot of sayings there, aren't I? I'm going to run out Love of it. it. We're writing a book Oi. off the back of this. Oi. I'm literally <laughs> taking, taking them down. Yeah, yeah. So when you're, when you're given an interview, when you're given some reflection, it has to be truthful because then it can't come back and bite you in the arse, as things do. The players see through falsehoods because, you know, uh, they're human beings, aren't they? And they're all, to some degree, emotionally intelligent. Um, but you got me, you got me hot. I, you got me hot right after the game. You know, I just had him on the field and we talked about the truth that we knew on the back of the belief that we had um, in, in pushing Exeter to that close and probably should have winning if we closed the game out as we'd, uh, as we'd done in the past. But I came straight into that interview hot and angry and emotional. Um, but I, 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 I stand by the words that I said because they were truthful at the time. Whether or not it's the reality or just my perception I think probably the former, sorry, the latter rather than the former. That was my perception of the events as they unfolded on the field. Uh, the reality we'll, we'll see this weekend. Uh, but it, it, it's something that we do with the players that we brought in from uh, interaction with ex-special forces, which is a hot debrief. A lot of coaches, a lot of teams 
they, they use the computer as a, as a crux almost. And it's easy once you've watched the game back, once you've had two days to reflect on it, once you've talked to your mates, you kind of know the answers. But where I'm trying to get to is an understanding and a feel of what it's like on the field uh, and an emotion afterwards. And then that's is what the, the, the special forces do, the police do. Straight after an event, they interview everyone, they understand where their emotions are at, and then they get a cold reflection a day, two days later. So we do both. We, we, we talk to lads afterwards and, and everything's open because if you're talking about feelings, you're never wrong with a feeling. It's how you feel. And then we understand how that fits in with the reality a day or two later. And that's something we've been pushing um, since I started at Saracens and something we took from the Antibidian teams, the Crusaders, the Melbourne Storm, Richmond AFL. That's a line that they're going down with to marry up the emotion, the mental aspects with the physical, the technical and the tactical. Yeah. Is it a bus ride back from Sandy Park? Would you fly? It's a six hour bus ride back, yeah. It's so a long so, so how, how's that working for you? Do, you? do you sit at the front and just stew or can you can you find a release that means you can actually chat to the person next to you on by hour three? Yeah, yeah, exactly what like you said. So there's a bit of a, a bit of kicking stones for want of another cliche. Um, and then you watch the game uh, and you understand where your feelings were at in relation to, to actually what happened. Um, and then marry that up with some conversations. I was on the phone from like half eight through till three o'clock yesterday. A lot of small conversations and together you work it out. We've gone to the days where I think you have one um, autocratic um, genius of a coach who comes in and says, this is it, this is why go ahead boys you know the players need input they need to be involved and why wouldn't you they're at the cold face they're the guys with the knowledge them's the ones that felt it so i, I want all that information in off them and really for them to lead on a monday morning there should be no surprises got you because so i'm interested by, by that actually because you know for so many coaches though that they, they still they still go along with that methodology i'm very much a, a believer of what what you're saying in terms of the the interaction i think a lot of what comes out from stuff I've read, stuff I've spoken to players, is obviously the psychological element of everything you do and, and understanding the relationships between the players and not just going, right, this is how we're doing it. Um, and and that and you're sticking to it. You seem to always be quite fluid in everything. Were you like that? Did you like that as a player? Was that something you've learned? Or, or you know, where, where did it all come from, that kind of that thinking? Because I'm fascinated by it. Um, I, I certainly probably wasn't like that as a player. Um, it, it wasn't the environments I was involved in. Potentially, subconsciously, there was a, a want and desire to change if I had the opportunity. Certainly, a lot of what I do is, how would I, how would I, how would I want it if I was a player? So there's a degree of empathy there, putting myself in them shoes. But I haven't played for a long time. Asking the further, the longer you, you're up, away from the game, the further you are from it in terms of that feeling. So, why wouldn't you use their understanding, their knowledge, as to gain a better insight as to feeling and emotion? There are times uh, where they just need, they want to know, this isn't good enough. This is how you do it. And, and I guess ultimately, um, if it comes to it, I've got to fulfil that role as a coach. And I've had to do that with Sale, a, sale, a team that have been extrinsically motivated for a lot of years. They've needed uh, direction and a bit of a stick. Uh, but the, the, the utopia is that as we go on, they become so self-sufficient as a group so driven intrinsically and individually that they're driving it. And, it. and in some of my experiences during the best times at Saracens were the times where I did, least, did the least coaching in terms of direction and on-field coaching. The players took charge of it. In fact, around this time every year, they took charge of it. So my experience from the best teams in, in the best environments, the ones that are player-led, player-driven, that takes time to develop. I think, did you notice when you come into a group, like, for example, you had Saracens, and I know that you worked very hard to get that kind of, uh, those players to take that empowerment, because, you know, sports people can often sometimes be, you know, yes, they can be selfish and they have to be sort of narrow-minded, but also they can be a little bit complacent. Sometimes they want to be spoon-fed. You talk about players kind of, you know, having the expectation for people to do stuff for them. I know you worked hard on Saracens to get into that place. Did you come and look at Sale and go straight away, oh, I can see this group needs probably uh, to be more individualistic. They need to take more responsibility. How quickly do you assess that? Because it's quite a bold thing to come in and start, ask, you know, asking players to take responsibility. Because sometimes 
You know, you see them sitting around waiting for answers. Yeah, I probably got it wrong a few times at the start, honestly. Um, I probably gave too much to them with this ideal of how I wanted the environment to be. But we spent the first six weeks ask, um, in conversations, a lot, a lot of small conversations, understanding our identity. I don't know that's like a bit of a buzzword, but it, in layman's terms, they had to understand who they were or who they wanted to aspire to be as a team. And strip that back, who they are as individuals, and they were quite a tight bunch. But the first exercises we were and was kind of listen to each other's stories, as fluffy as that may seem. Um, but within the first half an hour, they admitted that they didn't know as much about each other as what they thought they knew. And once you start opening the blinkers up, well, you think you're tight, but look how much tighter we can get. That's just the first part of the process of six weeks of conversations from who we are to why we're here. And then the last part of the process, is how we're going to go about it, the on and off field behaviours. I think most people, most coaches start with a process, right? How can we play rugby better? Whereas for me, that should be the last layer that you put on. It has to start with the identity, with who you want to be and what's driving you. Um, so yeah, that was that was discovered and derived over the first six weeks. It's it's a it's a process of constantly reaffirming and reinforcing. Um. I don't often do this, but I actually, in order to turn this into an episode of This Is Your Life, I actually rang your brother, who I had many happy years trotting up and down a touchline with, and is, is just one of the faves in that regard. And one of the things that he said that was really interesting is that you're not actually much of a rugby fan. He said you're really interested in people and process yeah. and progress, but actually the rugby is sort of fairly incidental. Does that does that ring true, or has is he, is he got that wrong? Well, I don't know. I guess, I guess he's, he's right. I don't know. I don't, I don't mind watching a game and being a supporter, but I can't remember the last time I did right. watch them and be a supporter because a lot of my viewing of rugby is done with doing an LSI, um, looking at the, the minutiae and the fine detail. So that's that's not enjoyable. Um, and I've been around sport all my life, and I'm very grateful for what it's given me. It's given me everything, but it's sport doesn't define my life. It's just part of my life. What, what I am constantly surprised, amazed and challenged by is, is people and, and the personalities and what drives them and how you get commonality of thought and commonality of purpose and how you build a team and keep a team and the feeling that you get when you succeed with a team, when you fail with a team, it's there's no better feeling. That's That could be in any sport, I guess. It just happens to be rugby being the medium for me because that's where I've had my experience. One of the other things he said, which I thought was really interesting, is I said, are you surprised how well Alex has gone? And he said, absolutely not. He said, he's your classic younger brother. He's taken a hell of a beating over the years. And that sort of has shaped him into it. But he said, I'm in no way surprised that he is not only where he is, but how much further he'll go as well. As well. Is this something... That, that sort of feels very natural to you? Would you ever, do you ever, or have you ever on the road sort of thought, how the hell have I ended up here type thing? Do you have well, the same belief that your brother sees in you? Well, yeah. Would, and that's probably the second compliment he's ever given me. Right. Uh, so I'll write that down. I'll keep that. <laughs> uh, I'll ring this him is later. your life. Yeah, I'll ring him later. Um, our coach is generally through feeling, but feeling based on experience, I think... Um, Simon Sinek talked about thin slicing and the ability to, to gauge in an instant um, through whatever it be, a cluster, and that could be a conversation that you have, um, a ways to go, um, or a, a means to, to direct, to, 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 to converse, to reflect. So, so it, that is based on feeling. If it generally feels right, it's generally going to be right. Um, but I, look, there's not a day go by where I don't think I'm lucky and I don't feel like I'm fooling a lot of people. There's not a day goes by. And that's and then then it's never a job, is it? The, the eight hours of conversation they had on the phone on Sunday, it's not a chore because you're building. You, 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 it's a choice. It's not a chore. It's a choice that I want to do because I know I know what we can achieve on the back of it. And it, and, it, and it takes it takes dedication. It takes your Sundays. It takes a lot away from your personal life. But the, the overall feeling of, of 
what you can look back on and, and reminisce on and enjoy with your mates um, is something that never leaves you. Um, so I'm a little bit hooked in that sense, I guess. Um, let's keep the confidence going. Tins, the question I want to ask you, so I, I remember seeing this a few weeks ago. Somebody threw out on Twitter, you can pick one athlete ever to have an injury-free career from beginning to end. Who are you choosing? Jake Montgomery was the guy who asked the question. And Mark Evans, um, sort of Exequins and Saris, et cetera, said Alex Sanderson. I've never been more convinced about an 18 or 19-year-old becoming a world-class player. Injuries meant we only got glimpses. Tins, you, you played together. Am I right in saying a lot through the age groups, et cetera? Yeah, we, we played, obviously, uh, Al was at some wrong side of the Pennine school. And <laughs> uh, what school were you at? I can't remember. We play, I don't know Kirkham, the mighty Kirkham. Kirkham, Kirkham. Yeah. So play Kirkham a fair bit, but then we first sort of clashed heads at uh, North Training at eighteens, and I, I didn't, I wasn't like picked, so I was always angry, and Al was always picking off back of a scrum at eight, and we just have a bit of a ding dong all the time and have a smile about it afterwards, and um, but that was sort of actually having someone like that that impressed Jeff Whoppet. I mean, having to try and tackle Al repeatedly off whilst they were working on back back row moves, and um, and then we went on we were on the England tour together in '97 to to Australia, and Al was basically him and Simon Daniele just never had a top on. They were so <laughs> ripped to shreds. They literally oh, never put, never put clothes <laughs> on and just walked around with Australian girls swooning after them. Um, and then we just dived into the slip. So. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I mean, in terms of you look at what mentality he takes to coaching now, and that's what he what he played with. Um, he's so smart, but was a physical specimen as well. And it was a shame um, that the the injuries the injuries kept coming. Do you look back, Alex, at your playing career and think, God, I'd love another go at that, and to tape up the bits that I needed to tape up or do you feel you got as much out of it as you could? I mean, where are you at with yourself as a player? Well, uh, I let, I let that uh, dream die a long time ago. You have to you become bitter and old. Not many <laughs> friends if you keep harping back to yesteryear. I was very lucky enough to play with a lot of great players. A lot of good friends might be. And one of them, Mike, in my 15 minutes of fame in the sun was the first person that was the person that gave him a try from the first cap against Romania. He gave me the pass. I don't know if he remembers. So I, I, don't, I, I should do, because not many passes ever stuck. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah, so, shows you know, how good you were, that you managed to hold on to it. I, mean. now, I was like, so close to the line. You could have just walked from yourself. I know it was cool and altruistic, altruistic moment for you, Mike. Um, <laughs> what are you drinking there? You know, all right, I just thought he was neck in a bottle or something. Uh, so no, it's no, it's a, pro, it's, a pro, it's a protein show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I haven't been asked that question for so long because I guess my coaching career has surpassed what my playing career was. It's nice to be asked again. And there was a time where people would ask you all the time, do you miss it, do you miss it? And I guess there was, but um, uh, I, I honestly don't anymore. I guess as a player, and you all know this, Mike, and ask, you have to be very self-obsessed for the most part. You have to get everything out of yourself. Um, it's, even though it's a team sport, you have to understand how you reach your peak and, and how that then kind of contributes to the whole. As a coach, it's not about yourself, it's about everyone else. Uh, and so that kind of methodology or way of thinking suits me better, I guess, now I've had time to reflect on it. So no, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't be sat where I am now. Um, I wouldn't be with my wife or have my kid and be back up north um, leading this great group of lads if, if I retired later. You know. But that, So that's why I asked the question really is, do you think you are where you are now because the, the, the passion that you had as a player was never quite fulfilled or, or is that sort of incidental to the journey that you've been on subsequently? No, definitely at the time because uh, I had offers for the banking world, which my brother has gone, gone into. No, reg so, no regrets? I mean, he, he is just living the life, isn't he? Well, did, mate. He's got a swimming pool and horses and stuff. <laughs> I've earned a fraction of what he earned. But I think in some ways, we're both quite envious of, of yeah. each other. Parts of our lives, I'd like some more money. And they'd like to have a more, I guess, holistic and meaningful existence. 
So, you know, you, you sacrifice certain parts to make up for, for what you want out of life, if we're being philosophical about it. I, I always wonder, is it, is it easier if, if you know... Because uh, I always think what's di difficult transitioning out of rugby is if you do it on your own terms or if if you feel that, you know, your body has just packed up. Was it because it was so... You knew it was just... You had that injury, it's never going to be right. It makes it an easy, clean cut. Or did was it still hard that first six months, a year? You, you, did you have think, well, I could think I could get back and play? Or did it just naturally flow into way the the path that you're on now rather than asking a lot of questions of why, what ifs, maybes. I, I, I just chucked myself into it at the time. By the way, there's, there's probably three or four times a year I think I can come back and play. Right, I have a good session in the gym. I'd go for a good run. I'm like, if they need me this weekend, I'm ready to go. But then like, I'll play touch or fall over and I won't be able to feel my, my feet for a day or two. And I realized that it was a good reason why I retired. Um, at the time, different to people who retired at the end of the career like you guys who have achieved so much because you built up a lot around you in terms of your life I imagine um, that require money finance um, the need for you to sustain your notability um, in the sport in arena whereas I, I, had a, I had a blank canvas like I, I just I didn't have a girlfriend at the time I'd only just met my current wife I've only had one wife but... <laughs> <laughs> yes, hey, it's, <laughs> it's <laughs> only the um, so, and so I went to Australia and just and lived it and loved it um, and I still to this day if I stop enjoying what I'm doing there's easier ways to earn money there is easier ways so that's one of my mantras and I said to the boys like we're, we're going to have fun doing this it has to be fun like the triumph and the travesty we've got to love it all um, and I'll stand by that as soon as going to stop enjoying it for a prolonged period of time because there's always periods which are difficult but for a long period i, I just hang my whistle up so to speak and move on to something else uh, do you think um the, 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 the fact you went to australia because obviously again I, i'm doing my kind of research and reading around it obviously you, you went to so many different teams did so much stuff you know so many people who now finish rugby um go straight into coaching in in, in england whereas it seems like you went and kind of explored did so much, so much different stuff, and then came back kind of when you were ready, when you felt an impact. But you were just sort of soaked up and absorbed so much. Do you do you, do you find that the most invaluable part of the journey you've been on so far? Well, it's a, that's a constant journey. That ask it is. You have to keep soaking it up. The moment you think like this is the old cliche again. The moment you think like you made it, someone else overtakes you. Like you, you've really got to keep innovating and improving your methodology whilst staying true to who you are what your values are be consistent to those things keep coming back to them otherwise you'll, you'll get lost in the social media world and all that who, who, who are the, the, the people you work with you, you feel has shaped your methodology what we see now because i remember speaking to kind of warren gatlin and he, he he brought it down to three separate players that he'd worked with when he was younger one he felt gave the aggressive edge one he felt was the guy that did the emotional connection and he sort of cherry picked those bits. Obviously you're constantly evolving as you say, and I think you're right. You know, you're like a, when a shark stops swimming, it dies. It's the same thing with the evolution of a person. You have to keep learning, but there must be a few people on those journey where you thought, you know what? I really like what they do. This is what I, I, I kind of want to be known as. Cause I don't imagine when you finished at 26, you knew what kind of coach you wanted to be. No, I, no, I didn't. And I still, I still, I understand for the most part, the things that I won't relent on in regards to my principles and values, but the methodology is constantly shifting for the group. Um, and to, to quote the first person that gave me the leg up and the first person that inspired me or gave me an eye, an eye open as to what degree of dedication that coaching required was Eddie Jones. And he talked about being a chameleon. Uh, so essentially, you're the same animal, but you change your colour, you change your stripes in the environment. You know, you're able to do that. Uh, and, and Eddie showed me what it is to have a process behind the methodology, the plan, and then plan again. Um, and work ethic. You know, you, you, you finish playing and your days are eight till three. 
well, as a coach, Marie Jones, the, the, the six till six, so are you able to maintain that kind of attention and focus for longer periods of time while still, while still enjoying it? Um, so that's the first one. And then under that kind of very closed and process-driven environment, in came Brendan Venter. He was anything but. He was all about people. He was... He was about the love and the family and the connections. He was about intensity when you're there, not duration. So he, he'd burn himself out. He'd have seven Red Bulls and go by three. And he'd have two fights in the coach's room. You know what I mean? Do a bit of training and then and then bugger off. And and that and that for me fitted me in terms of my personality better because I was more about the people and more about the fun and more about the family. But I wouldn't. I've been half a coach if I didn't have the ground in the base what Eddie gave me. And then fast forward another two years, Mark McCall. And uh, as you know, like I don't, I'm not scared of a camera. Uh, <laughs> do the odd interview, but uh, he is the one person that's able to leap from behind. He's the one, he's the, the testament of what you can do when what people can achieve when you don't take the credit. Uh, and he was he was awesome at making you believe. That you had autonomy, but you really didn't. So, like the, the, the questions it ask, you think like you come up with a solution, but he just figured out the right question. Uh, and I still really, I rang him, spoke text him Sunday, spoke to him Saturday, spoke to him last Thursday. I will ring him this week. So he's still very much a mentor and a friend of mine, Mark. So there's the three professional coaches. I lied to the mighty Kirkham coach, that was Brian Gornall, um, who, who's my best mate. So he just comes round for. The odd curry and the odd beer every now and again. That, that kind of shows you the kind of coach I would like to be if I could. You, don't have to, you can't be everyone, mate. You can't be everyone's mate. It's impossible. But there's a level of respect there, at least. And with some of them, I'll have mates for life. I, I hope. I'm sure I'll have a beer with Jamie George in the summer and a few of the lads at Ferris. Can, I, can, I, can we explore with, Can we explore those in more detail? So, so Eddie obviously got you into it. What's your relationship like with him now? I mean, I, I obviously there's a lot of respect. Is there is there a butt? Is there a kicker? No. Have you Audio. been on a journey to get? I mean, what, the reason I ask that is a lot of so Matt Gitter, who we spoke to not that long ago, said, and Will Guinea said exactly the same thing that when Eddie Jones walks into a room, they feel like they are 19 years old again. They haven't done their homework. They're in the wrong class at the wrong time, and they just are waiting to be told they've got it wrong. Now, obviously, you were a coach, and therefore. There is a different dynamic, but I just wonder whether him helping you onto your coaching path, whether that sort of relationship changes as you now go up the ranks at Saracens and now take over at Sale. I presume you talk to him from an England perspective nowadays, do you? Uh, not, not, not too often. I, I have more communication with the the other home nations coaches, um, but it's not to say. Does that surprise that... you? Did Eddie know? No, he, he calls me when we want, when we want a, when we're trying to align England's directives and wants to a player with our own. He's like, well, you have to do that. There's no point us pulling in different directions than some of the England players. And I, I think he feels that we're very aligned. He must do, otherwise he would communicate that. He, I have regular contact with a lot of the staff. So Crowfoot's been down, all his SNC stuff has been down. Late Simon Amor. We'll go back to Dust <laughs> <laughs> uh, So, um, this is a bit squeaky. From my end, like, you, you can ask him, but he invited me down to an England match when we were allowed to go down. I sat next to his wife, Hiroko. He used to get me, used to send food into me uh, when I was coaching the Reds. You know, um, sent sent a teddy bear to Ty. His daughter was was quite ill a year or two ago, and I, I moved heaven and earth and did everything I could to help her. There is zero animosity and only respect coming from my corner, um, and 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 I guess in some ways because he is has always been that kind of, and is always that <laughs> fatherly kind of figure, that senior head coach. Um, in some ways, maybe I'm always craving that little bit more respect from him, whether or not I've got it. Um, I haven't done anything yet, have I? Let's face it. I haven't. It's still really early days, but I hope to, to yeah, to earn, earn respect in the eyes of kind of legends like that, then, then you know you're doing well. That is really interesting. Sorry, Hats. I, I just want to, I suppose, rephrase the question then, which is that 
and and James will testify to this, that, and, and Eddie has spoken himself actually with us before about the fact that he feels he's been on a journey and he has mellowed and he's much more aware of what the modern player wants, which is about the person relative to where he was probably 15 years ago when he openly admits he was very, very tough to work with and to work for. And I just wonder whether when you came through at Saracens, with hindsight, it felt like that was the tough love phase. Yeah, definitely. It was. It was. And without the tough love and Brendan coming in, um, given the support and the care that only a Brendan better could, we, Saracens wouldn't have achieved what they've achieved. It's not solely down to, well, I mean, for the most part, it is down to Mark McCall because sustaining success is more difficult than attaining it. Much more difficult in my, in my understanding. But there was a process and a timing of it all where the planets kind of align, where you've had those influences for Mark McCall to step in and, and, and then progress them on to where they are now or where they have been and where they will be again after the 60 point mill drumming they went the weekend. They still got it. Yeah. Ah, sorry. Yeah, no, I'm, I was going to actually ask exactly the same thing. I'm, I'm just fascinated because I, I, I spoke to Eddie. I'd heard all the rumours about what he was like as um, a, a coach and a person and everything else. And obviously when he took over England, I always had the expectation of, you know, the meltdown, the, these kind of moments that you kind of go down in history that everyone sort of talks about. But I, never, I didn't see that. Now, I know that obviously in any environment, People always kind of get pushed to their extremes, especially when they work with Eddie. But when I spoke to him, he he kind of, whereas you've gone in that and take the process driven thing, gone this way. He's gone from process driven to um, what he's talked to me about was the cognitive well being of players, and seems to have gone full yeah. circle. Well, not full circle, but sort of gone to that point where he's realised now what you've advocated from the start, and it's quite interesting to see you both talking about that. Whether you know whether he he. Um, is as good as it is you and everything else that understands it because where I, I, I can already hear from the way you talk that that passion for, for understanding and the psychological element it, it was just very interesting to see that um that he's sort of gone that way and come back to where you are now and sort of understands that i mean i don't i'd be interested to see what you two would be like working together i mean would you ever do that again yeah, of course i wouldn't rule it out i wouldn't rule it out i've worked them twice I don't think anyone worked with them three times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're, they're dead. They're dead. They did try, but they died. Working <laughs> somewhere, like, I, I'm a glutton for punishment. So, yeah, of course, I wouldn't rule it out. And I, I, I hope to have some conversations with him moving forward. Now, now I'm in this position, this role. Um, there's a lot I can still learn from Eddie. Maybe vice versa. I, I don't know. But do, you have to have both ask. You have to have. The cognitive well-being and the process, uh, and, and it's a bit of a sliding scale on that because, like you say, they can get too too well looked after and get slightly complacent, and, there, and therein lies the duality of um, let's call it culture, right? Let's just call it culture. Everyone has a word for it, whatever they want to deem themselves as. We call us brotherhood at the moment, but the duality of brotherhood. On one side, you have for those who've got brothers, for example, you have the care, the support, like what mine's given me. <laughs> you have the fun, the enjoyment, all, all those soft things. And on the other side, you've got the drive and the competitiveness and the accountability and the honesty that only a brother can give you. And I think you need both. And that's what Eddie is. He's brutally honest at times. And he has got drive and he's got accountability. And that's been his mantra for a while. But in any good environment, you need the two. And it's almost like a, a bit of a scales. Sometimes you get it a little bit wrong and it's all about evening up those scales to make sure you get the best of both worlds. Is that, is that the biggest, is that the hardest building block to sort of fill? Because of going through what I went through into teams that I've been through was more old school all the way from the start rather than environment. And then obviously as you were shifting through and you saw what Saris was doing, what Exeter built, um, you know, what you're building a sale. <coughs> It's all become that if you create the environment, then you can work on the other building blocks. But sometimes, does do you have to keep a check on? But they're just not getting pampered, and they're all getting all the good things. As long is there a occasional reminder sesh where you look, look, lads, you're getting all this stuff, and I need a bit more of this out of you. Is yeah. that just a constant balancing act? Is it? Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, constant, constant. So we have these, apart from the re the mental, cognitive well-being kind of 
chats that we talked about, the reflection, the readiness. Right, so there's two of them a week, which we're never in the schedule when you're playing. So these are without computers, these are conversations without clicks or on feelings, emotions, on the communication between the players. I have two of them a week. We've also got what we call a trademark meeting, which is exactly that, to understand on a bigger scale what our on and off field behaviours are like, where we're sitting on that balancing act of drive and support or accountability and fun. So we're constantly addressing it you know, on a week to week basis. And that's that for me is the skill, keeping that fresh as opposed to players rolling their eyes saying we're in a good place. If you're in a good place, why are you in a good place? Can you identify that? We, we're constantly addressing it, Tim. I want to just quickly, you mentioned the home nations. I mean, are you in regular contact with Gregor, Wayne Pivak? And I mean, I presume you know Andy Farrell quite well from Saris days, anyway. Is it, and is it rugby they're talking about? Is it you that they want to talk about? What are the conversations with the others? Yeah, not me. Um, and not so much Andy, but Fosh is. But Fosh, Mike Fosh goes down and stays at Andy Farrell's house. Got you. Kevin, and he'll be this summer. He'll be permitting. So I, I get a good I get a good feel on how Andy's doing through Fosh. Um, when Gregor and stuff, it was about some of their players, you know, some of the younger lads that weren't communication over. But uh, I, I really like Gregor, he's very open about some of his, some of the things that he's seen in the methodology and stuff. So we had chats just about rugby, what he was seeing and we were taking little bits, what I was seeing, so we're sharing information there. Um, and then with Wayne, um, again, a lot of time for the man, because he'd come into a lot of stick, didn't he, at the start. And I spoke to him whilst he's reforming his, his squad and how he pulled it, how he pulled it back round again is a testament to so his ability as a coach, really. So again, conversations in and around that and around Will Griff John at the time and what's happening with him. So the players were the lead in, but it ended up being quite long conversations about rugby in general, really. I love that. I mean, Pivac sort of knocked up us all a little bit for six when we had him on. We just didn't know what to expect. And then exactly what you were saying, he was all about the relationships with his players, picking up the phone, having those conversations and just making making friendships and then building off the back of that, wasn't he? And we were like, both me and Hask were like, yeah, we'd play for him. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah, he's a nice lad, isn't he? He's a really good fellow, yeah. And are you, are and you he was surprised? A cop, and he's a cop. He's a cop. The greatest... Hansen was our yeah, 70s we cre- cop show we, off the back we, of it. We created the greatest T-shirt that we're not allowed to make. Damn it. <laughs> yeah. It was better. We, we imagined like, um, it was like Pivac but leaning up against a car in a leather jacket, Hanson eating chips. They just stopped off, and then like the radio goes like, "Fuck it, hell, Steve! I don't want to leave the chips. Throwing the chips out of the way, skidding cars, drinking that hip flush, you know, using criminals' heads to open doors." I pitched this whole idea, uh, and P- Wayne was like, "Brilliant!" And then we got this T-shirt done, and then suddenly he wouldn't answer his phone anymore, and we, oh, we couldn't. Just couldn't, like yeah. the Basky and Hutch type cop, but I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely it was. Right. It was. Um, but I was gonna. I was gonna actually. Ask, sorry, yeah, I, I just went to ask. What, I know you. I know. And I know you're always gonna say you always look in. But one of my criticisms when I finished playing was is that so much stuff done in rugby actually, uh, bar the stuff you were doing at Saracens, is still quite old school. Still a focus on you know one size fits all. Very much like you know, uh, uh, task focused, not necessarily people focused. Are you still surprised? And obviously you've said some of the home nation guys are quite like you in that, 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 in that methodology. Are you still surprised that rugby is still housing so many people who are just not focusing on those emotional, uh, psychological areas? Because I, I, I am. I, I'm not going to point fingers and say who you do, but are, are you surprised or not? No, I am. It feels, it feels quite obvious. It seems quite obvious to me. Uh, good design borrows gene and steals, you know, and I just do what the best team are doing. And like I say, a lot of what I, I'm, I'm, in, I'm putting in at sale now was a result of Saracen, but also Zoom meetings that I had with the Crusaders and the Storm and Richmond AFL. We had a lot of conversations about how the, the two or, or the three, four organisations differed, Saracens and these guys, all top of the all apex predators in their own spheres, really. And... The, the, the fingerprint for success looks very similar across all the organisations, by the one we're talking about, which is this cognitive well-being and understanding more of the mental aspects of the game. And, and for me, it makes sense in, in other ways that sports science has taken massive strides you know, across every sport. You can see that in football, Formula One, and now in rugby. 
Um, and the amount of data you can collect and, and attain from sports science is massive. Um, but everyone's looking for those marginal gains that you can get from meters per minute or excels or heart rates and all that kind of stuff. But that's exactly what they are, marginal. People like it because you can measure it. If you do a task and you can measure a task and you can see the outcome, you can do that better at that outcome. So that's why it's comfortable for people to go back to something that's quantitative. Because what we're talking about is not quantitative. It's intangible. You can't measure it, but I know it works. And, and more's the point, because no one else is really doing it, really buying into it, it's not marginal gains you can make in this area. It's massive gains if you buy into it. And, and, I've, got, and I've got to keep the lads buying into it because we started off really well and we did a lot of mindfulness, a lot of breathing, and we did some yoga. And we're giving them all these tools, right, to be better athletes in the moment. Um, and I started seeing it slip about four months in. Just little things like one or two wouldn't turn up for a breathing session. And like what you said, Tim, there was just a bit more mess in terms of around the, around the training venue and people weren't really tidying up after themselves. Um, and I spoke to some ex-Special Forces guys and they talked about the Marines, right, having a nine-month training programme. Nine months. And said, so why do you think that is, Al? When the Navy and the Army is like eight to ten weeks. I'm like, I've got no idea. And they said, well, it's because the Marines have identified that it takes nine months to eradicate all your old ethoses in terms of your own cultures and values. It takes nine months to implant, if you're up for it and open to it, a, a new identity in terms of what you're about, your values, your ethos, your culture. So going back to the lads with this bit of information, I'm like, my boys, it's working for us. And as soon as you think it's all working, you don't need it and go back to your old habits. That's when it starts to slip. I'm like, just, just give me till Christmas. And I, I'm, I'm talking about myself here as well, because I don't want to go back with being a Saracen. Like, we're finding our, our new identity and our new way of doing it. And with all these things that we've been doing, who's to say this works and this doesn't? Because you don't know, because you can't measure it. What we do know is that it's all working. So give me till Christmas. And by Christmas, if it hasn't worked, or if you're not on board, then fine, go your own separate way, do what you want to do. But let's give it nine months and see where we're at then. So that's, that's the party line at the moment. And how quickly have you seen an uptick off the back of that? Well, yeah. And I expect it to, to fade in time again, because we are only human and humans are creatures of habit. So you go back to old habits, but that's when you've got to revisit it again, Tins, and, and talk about where we're at, how far have we slipped. And by the, when, when we lose or lose a, a series of games, it won't be that week that it slipped. It would have happened three or four weeks before the slides already happened. So it's important then, that's when you're in a crisis meeting. So that's why it's important week in, week out to try and prevent that slide before it does happen. The old, the old crisis meeting where you decide that you want to train harder. That's how we, what you used to do yeah. in, the, in the good old days. And we just yeah. go and flog ourselves and beat the crap out of each other again. Well, put a keg in the middle of the room and just yeah. walk up the keg till it's done. Yeah. That's the best practice in the last, that's the yeah. All, all, we hail, tried to all hail Mitchell. John Mitchell is the best at that. We, tr we tried to convince Di Young to do that once. He was like, oh, I bet you fucking want us to put a load of beers in the changing rooms. Get on the fucking piss. Well, it's not happening, Haskell. Fuck off. I was like, all right. I was just, I, I, it was just an idea. I was just an idea. Like, you don't have to run with it, Chief. That was it. I tell you what we're going to do. We're going to fucking train harder. I was like, oh, okay. Well, I guess we're going to do that then. Thank you much. And, and I, I went back to change rooms. I was like, lads, I said to Spy, I spoke to Di. He's not really into it. And we're, we're actually not having a day off this week. So I had the like, that's cool, you've got scared. Never mind. We've got 2200 <laughs> tomorrow. See you there. Yeah. Do you remember that? But you, do, 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 I mean, I don't, you must have been part of that. Those, those, those groups where, I mean, I sort of avoided some of that. Um, where, you know, say, for example, you lose on a weekend. So I give you the scenario, I give you, you lose on a weekend. You have a meeting on the Monday morning. You don't have any of those micro conversations you talk about. You have a meeting, everyone's kicking stones. Coaches are giving you stink eye. I've had that with the national team where we've lost. All the coaches don't even come in the change room. They're all in the corner giving you like stink eye, like tutting as you walk past. So you're like, fuck, well, I, I might as well retire. <laughs> then you go in that meeting on Monday morning. They, they abuse you and they go, right, what the fuck happened? And everyone's really honest in rugby and they go, ah, oh, like, yeah, I missed a tackle. Like, yeah, but what else happened? Well, look, we slow start. Well, well, what else happened? Well, we didn't. The standards in the week weren't good enough. So what we're going to do? Well, we're going to train harder. Everyone goes, yeah. And then they leave the room 
And then yeah. there's all the tackle shields out. They go, right, forwards, you go here. Right, put the shields on. Kick fuck out of each other in the down in, in that area. Again, you go, right, live contact. Everyone comes out and goes, yeah, we're ready. And I'm like, I don't think we've done any mental development, covered up yeah. any, like, why did we have a slow start? Why is that happening? Just saying train hard is like telling a depressed person to cheer up. Like, why, why, how did that... <laughs> How did that happen? And, and that's the, psych the psychology. Or even worse is they play on a Saturday and they go, right, Sunday, you lot lost. You're not having a day off. Right, come in, you know, seven, 700, 100. So you're like, but I, I, I've just played a game. It doesn't matter. Toughen you up. I'm like, I, I, but this still, to this day, not as much, goes on. And I just can't get my head around it. Uh, yeah, it's weird, isn't it? I don't know if it's for the coaches. I mean, there's, there's, there's something about getting back on the horse. There is some um, cathartic element of coming in and knowing that you've worked hard and ridding some of those demons, like getting rid of some of them. But, um, you yeah, know, as a means to progress, yeah, I'm, I'm with you, mate. I don't think it's the way for me. But, but you'll always get one, though, where you'll be in that crisis mood. I think we had one in uh, Bath when Robbo was coach. And and he was like, right, lads, we're just going to go out and enjoy ourselves and play. We won the next 12 on the bounce. <laughs> But yeah, come later on when he was when he was England coach and there was a crisis meeting, it was like, no, we're training harder. I was like, remember that time at Bath where you just said, let's go and have some fun and enjoy ourselves when we play? It went really well for us. No, we're going to train harder. And Wells is going to get, John Wells is going to get a nugget here. Nugget here. I guess that's pressure, mate. Like, and yeah. I felt a bit of it myself. How do you handle that? Like, there's um, Jamie Langley. We've just had Jamie Langley come into the club. He's, he's got the brain the size of a planet. You need to get him on this. He's a brilliant genius coach and a good lad. He's got bigger biceps than you ask. Well, he can't come on the show. No, He's not like the show. He can't come on the show then. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> brother. <laughs> yeah. 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 No. And, he, and, he, and he referred this week um, to a runner called Bo Fontaine. Have you heard of him? In the 80s. Right. So this, this runner, he was the first ever sponsored Nike athlete. He's the only athlete that Nike have a statue dedicated to. I have all of them. There's this guy, Pro Fontaine. And he, at the time, was relatively young and held all the records, track records, for like 2,000, 5,000 miles, 10,000. He was set to be the best thing since last week ever. And he was on his route to be doing that. He was on his route to doing it. Um, he died in a car crash at the university. So he never got to achieve it. But he was on, he was on the route to doing it. And the reason why he was special. It wasn't because of his accolades. It was because of his, and Langers can fill you in this, but it's because of his attitude to racing. So his coaches used to despair, right? His coaches used to not understand why he wouldn't have a strategy for a race. He wouldn't sit behind someone and coast and then overtake him to finish because he thought it wasn't pure. He thought it was a cowardly way to win. So his expression was the only... Good, good pace, suicide pace. And today's a good day to die. That's him. And look, I know it's a little bit beating your chest kind of stuff. Um, but I think there's something that you, you, you can take from that. Another one of his mantras was that, or his beliefs that he set his standards at something higher than victory. So what I'm getting at here is that if, if you're going after something that is more than the result, that is... An overarching purpose, and for him, it was ending himself, you know, accepting true failure because he's given everything himself to win, right? If you have that, then the victory is never a pressure. The victory is never there, and it shouldn't go up. Your, your, your methodology, your motivation, because it doesn't even come into it. Um, so that, I guess, going back to the Robbo and, and, and all that, like, or, or it's my remit to win. I, I won't have a job unless I win. That comes as it did for for Pro from saying that I don't want to ally myself to a legend like that, but it, it comes as a result, as an outcome of everything else. Yeah. Have you have you ever caught yourself changing under pressure? Like I had to catch catch yourself and go, yeah. What the fuck are you doing, Al? Like why have I why am I doing yeah. that? I apologise to two lads today on selection because I didn't get them on early enough because I was caught up in the tri bonus. I was caught up in the outcome and that's that's my bad thinking that we just needed to score when actually we needed to stick in the process. And that lost us the game. That was a, a common feeling throughout the squad. So I apologise. That was the most do, recent do, time. Do you have like a sounding board? Does your, do, I mean, I know I met your I met your, your lovely wife, your only wife, we just reiterate that. Um, 
and you know <laughs> she's obviously you know like uh, you know has, has a big personality do you, does she keep you in check do you have like a sounding board that kind of che- checks you because yes it's all about trying to evolve and everything else but like you said we're only human and sometimes we can ca- get caught up in ourselves you need some honest conversations like with with these two on the show you know we've, we've become much more than co-hosts you know I speak to Alex more than I speak to uh, my wife um, which to my wife's joy and to Alex's you know <laughs> dismay and the same with tins as well yeah we, we share that i mean do, do you have that who, who keeps you going out you know alex i think you're drifting from where you need to be here so who watches the watchers that, this, that's a new thing for me because i always had mark mccall as um the very kind of dour unassuming type he kept dragging me down and telling me off in the meetings because i was too sweary or i wasn't pt enough um i still have him to some degree my missus is ace at it she was gonna, she'll, she'll tear me to bits and just in hearing some of the compliments you gave at the start of this, she'll rip me to bits on this. Um, and, and we're both advocates of not being part of social media for that. Because, you know, like you tend to, like gamblers, you listen to all the good comments and ignore all the bad, so. Yeah, yeah. Ones, unfortunately, we are trying. But... Yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm addicted the to the bad. Yeah. I don't get any good. I don't know, there's no reference, yeah. no That's frame of restaurant. <laughs> Yeah. Any kind of attention, any attention us. Shirt sure <laughs> off, I'm in. Is there, is there a, you know, you say Mark McCall was the guy who could lead from behind. Is is that something that you want you want to be? Because you're saying, would you prefer to step back and is there a, you bring someone else who's going to be the front guy who loves the TV and telling gags to, to BT commentators as well as he's watching the match? Or, or do you think... You're gonna be. Well, you want to be able to do that, but also you want to be able to do that. You want to have it as another string to your bow. Is there an ideal? Is there a better way of doing it? Is what I'm trying to get to. Do you think, or do you have to be true to yourself and then, but steal from all these guys and and add it to your add it to your feathers in your cap? I, I think some egotistical um, vain streak in me would love to do it all. I'd love to be the guy who heads it up, who motivates, who does the selection, but I just don't think it's realistic and plausible, and I'm not smart enough. Um, it's probably pretty draining, though, it would be as well. Yeah, it? yeah, yeah. But, like, so, so, you know, that, so I have this expression, you know, like, what would Jesus do? <laughs> People wear those bands. That, my expression is, what would Matt McCall do? Um, <laughs> there you go. There's I was. A t-shirt. I was is there a better way of doing it? There hasn't been a better way proven yet, has there? Given his record, so I don't think so. No. But well, Clive used to basically run a little bit from the back, and then as soon as we were in a marine ship that sank, and it, you had to specific orders to get by. He was the first one kicking you in the face as he was swimming past you. <laughs> so you get the fuck out. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so I don't know whether it always works that way. <laughs> Can I, I? I want to pick up on the. I want to ask you about Brendan. I want to ask you about Mark in just a moment or two. But what you were saying about the sort of just the men, the untapped resource, which is the mental side of the game. I read a quote before coming to this where you said increasing psychological safety, yeah. decreasing social desirability, which again yes. is something that we suffer from, and increasing self awareness, which we could certainly do with more of. Yeah. Increasing psychological safety, decreasing social desirability, and increasing self awareness. Those are the three phrases that I've coined, and that's what we're doing. Yes. What what does doing those three things actually look like, and what is the benefit of them? Right. So if we start with increasing the psychological safety, you know that's these are big these are big words, aren't they? These are psycho, psycho bubble words, and I, and I put them verbatim of a guy that's got five degrees in the sports psychologist at Saracens. And we talked about if we had a blank canvas, how would we do this again? Having learned all the lessons that we've learned at Saracens, how would we start again? Um, and the premise was around those three things. We understood those are the three things that we've, at our best, managed to create. So the psychological safety is a is an environment, create an environment where players and staff feel safe enough to be vulnerable at the times when they need to be vulnerable to be um, open enough to, to be able to share emotions and feelings and not just in a fluffy way, but like I say, in terms of great honesty, if, if it needed. Um, and that's that's everyone from the academy right through to the best players. 
um, psychological safety in meetings when, you know, coaches so clips, right, what should you have done? What could you have done? Um, for the need for them to, to speak up without fear of recrimination from the group, from the coaches. Creating that environment requires a lot of constant small conversations and affirmation to give them the space to be able to, to speak up. You have to create the time and space in your normal training week, which as you guys know, is almost defined by the minute, right? Each minute on the field, each minute in training, when your lunch is, it's to the minute, but can you create time in that schedule for, for, a, for not, maybe not to get the answer that you want, for the meeting to go on longer or shorter than you planned, but just to go through the process of people being able to talk and being actually listened to as well. So coach asking an answer because he wants to hear the answer, not because he wants to hear the answer that he wants to get. That's psychological safety for me. That's my favourite one where they, when they ask a question and they go and you give an answer like, yeah, no, it's good, but it's not quiet. It's like, oh, well, that's still an answer. And, you, and they, you keep going until they go, what was it? Communication. And then they put it up on the board. You're like, well, why don't you just fucking tell us it and stop us trying to answer your, your questions? Yeah, that, that, that's, the, that's the trap that a lot of people fall into. Like, and it's really nervy as a coach when you, open, when you put open-ended questions out. You don't know what you're going to get, but you've got to be prepared for that if you want to improve this. What we're talking about, this is the psychological safety. Social desirability is almost the opposite of that. That is saying things because you think other people want to hear it. it it's, it's conforming when to, to an environment or to a situation against what you feel and what you know is right because you want to be part of that. Um, that, that that's a funny thing, isn't it? Because everyone has to conform, I guess, every individual to the, to the team consensus. But then that's why you need to go through that process of identity so you understand what you're buying into. And these people who, who don't fit into that commonality of thought end up spitting themselves out. They end up spitting themselves out because... It's obvious to everyone that they are being so trying to be socially desirable rather than fitting in and being part of it. The self awareness that, that it goes hand in hand with the rest of them because how can you say what you feel and think if you aren't aware of what you feel and think? A lot of people are quite happy enough to go with the flow, but in the, the best players, the best players are so aware of their emotions in the, in the moment that they're able to switch them off and everyone's going about mindfulness. I've they asked for years, you know, the last dance, the Bulls, they did mindfulness. So it's no no new thing, this. But uh, an Owen Farrell, for instance, can miss a kick at goal, shelve it, get on with the job. He's probably the best at it. The best players are the most self-aware players, for my mind, most of the time. But that it, that's a, you can learn that trait. You can learn how to be self-aware. You can, you can coach it. So what we're trying to do is through, again, many varied small conversations and in groups less than six, because that's when you get conversation in the round. It has to be less than six. Asking questions of how and what, what led to that, open-ended questions of less than six sentences in and around feelings and emotions. And you can put it in context if you want to in game time. And through the repetition of those conversations, you increase the self-awareness over time. Um, so the three things are, aren't mutually exclusive. They are, they are all interlinked. Have you heard of social capital? Have you, heard of that? Have you heard of that, Ask? Well, I've capital. heard of relationship capital, not, not social capital. I don't know if it's the same thing in terms of the, the dynamics around you, the importance of the people you surround yourself with. If you're in a, like, a group of like-minded people all wanting to pull together, you're much more likely to be successful versus the, you know, you always know, there's always someone you know that it's everybody else's fault and, and everyone else is to blame. And then, and you, and sort of certain people have capped, they've reached the cap of their success. And that's what I, but I think social might be slightly different than that. Well, have you heard of it, Tim? Like, it's, it's not, it's, it's, again, it, it, it's, it's, I think it was a marketing term that a, a woman called Margaret Heffernan coined, and she was the CEO of 70 companies. And she talked about super chickens. Um, and that's a different story. I'll go back to social capital. Basically, so it works on the premise that 
I, I might have 30 conversations. Well, I added, I have 30, 40 conversations today, right? And the depth and the meaningfulness of those conversations, you could probably rate on a scale of one to 10. One being very much surface. Like, how was your night on Saturday? How many beers did you have? You know, look at the weather. That's a one or two. The nine or 10 conversation I had with AJ McGinty through his injuries, like, what are you doing with Sam? Is Sam your wife all right? Who's looking after Rocco? How are you feeling right now? You get to a level and depth of communication that is a, a lot, yeah, a lot more meaningful, right? And that, that's been built up over time. So through these small conversations, and all it is is these small conversations, sometimes it doesn't have to be about the game. It starts off quite meaningless and becomes quite meaningful as you go through. You can increase the, the, the social capital of organisation over time through having more meaningful conversations. So I have 40 of them, and maybe three months ago they were at a level two or three, and now we're at seven or eight, say, on that scale. And we know that the depth of relationship has correlation to the cohesiveness and the performance of the team. We know that, proven fact. And if they have 40 conversations with another with another 40 people during the day, and they have 40, it amounts to 2,000 conversations, say, a week. They're making these numbers up. But imagine how cohesive and how, uh, and how well you could work together if you move if you move that needle down the scale from, from a two to a six to a seven over the course of time. And in doing so, you do, you do just that. You, you, you increase psychological safety because there's an element of trust there that is built through communication. You decrease social desirability because you know each other better and, and they become more self-aware. So it, a lot of the process is based around social capital and, and the need to communicate and give them the time and space to do it. Well, I, I mean, it's A, absolutely fascinating. It's B, absolutely brilliant that it's fascinating and working which makes yeah. it very, very kind of easy to buy into. Do, 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 does, I mean, do, do you get challenged on this by the players or do they just say, yes, we'll go with it and try it? I mean, do you, is, is it quite a two-way street? Um, that was the most refreshing and surprising aspect to me coming in. I would, I, I would have thought that I would have had to cajole and persuade them that this was the way forward. But they were keen for it, eager for it, searching for it? Yeah, definitely. Amazing. That might have been how it's been in the past, but you know, in, in the original method of coaching, as you talked about, ask. Um, I want to ask you about what's to come in the next week or so before we finish up. But just very quickly, Brendan Fenter, Sorelli Bombo, whatever yeah. it was, three cheers for Sorelli Bombo. I mean, was it as mad riding in his wake as it possibly appeared? I mean, you've had your own moments with Taylor Swift, let's not forget. But have the, was it as mad following um, Brendan as it, as it appeared? Still following, really. There's still a little bit in my heart, you know, that is a Brendan Bentley. It's in that the way we're mates, though, and, and mentors, is that there's a little bit of them that you want to keep for yourself, a little bit of their personality pie that you want for yourself. Um, so, yeah, uh, I, I got a call from him yesterday. I got a text from him yesterday. We're still very much in communication. It was crazy. He, he is a maverick in many senses. I don't, I, I don't think I have the balls to be out, out there, but it's crazy people who don't realise are crazy, innit? So I don't think he does realise at times how mad he is, but I love it. I love it from him. It's his uniqueness. Unbelievable. Yeah. And Mark McCall, um, it, you know, the, the relationship between the two of you is, is obvious and, and is well sort of documented. Are you excited about the Luke Skywalker, Darth Vader moment that will come next season and the, the meeting on the time and are there lightsabers at the ready? How how are you going to handle a trip back to Saracens? Hopefully over a beer the night before. I actually thought about it last night, seeing that result, and I, and I kind of um, I pictured what it'd be like walking into a room, giving him a hug, and having a beer with him. I think I think it'd be that easy. And that that's what the game gives you, you know, when people talking about rugby. It's that side of it that I love, and I know it's cliche, but um, yeah, they're just they're just real good people, good mates, and I'm I've got this thing going here, and I'm loving it. I'm loving it, but I'm missing them equally because normally I'd be going through this with them. Last ten years, I'd be going through it with them. Will Mark play straight bass? 
in game week? Will he will he will he be very above board, or is there something a bit Machiavellian about him, and uh, he'll do whatever it takes? Well, I want to win, yeah. He'll definitely want to win, but uh, I don't. He, he, he would He's not a dishonest person. He won't cheat. He won't, he won't cheat his way to a win. But he'll, not, he'll use every every little bit. He'll, he'll give me nothing. He'll give you nothing. But then I'm quite the opposite. I'm like, here's, here's, here's knowledge. Do with it what you will. But the small, he keeps all his clouds close to me. I'm fascinated by that because I, I would definitely agree. Whereas you are the king of the half-time, full-time interview. I don't think I've ever had anything from Mark that isn't page one or two of the media handbook. And is basically, I'm using words, but there's not a, there's not a lot that you're going to take from this. I mean, he's the king of the maiden over in terms of that sort of media relationship. Is that is that very really deliberate? Is he just is he keep, does he keep his cards closer to his chest than any other man in the Premiership? Yeah, yeah, he is. He is. And we, and we ward it. We not ward over it at times, but we are from different schools of thought in that respect. For me, it's how you implement the knowledge. For him, any bit of knowledge is sacrosanct. So um, look, and again, it's it works, doesn't it? For him, it really does, does work for him. I've just I've got a mouth like a radio. This is why I'm quite afraid coming on this show. You put me on there now, ask. You haven't even talked. You haven't talked. That's what I mean. That in itself is a miracle, isn't it? That, that's what we do. Stop we just, just, we just. I, I, I start with the compliments. We ease it in. Before you know it, you're, you're going on. But, no, but that's surely, thing, though, it's if, not... if that's what the, if that's what you're wanting to, do, if that's what the game needs, um, and the the mental well being and all that side of it, that it needs to be shared. Otherwise, what's the point in you just hanging on to it and then no one else benefiting in players? Players don't, from around the world don't benefit. It needs to be shared. If that's the only way that bat coaches will get better and players will understand more, won't they? Oh, yeah. I think yeah. If you've got something good to shout about, and it's it's good, it's good. If you're building something that's going to benefit most people, then you should you should uh, celebrate that fact. That, um... It's made me realise that when I was coaching and just doing Auckland grids, I was way off the mark. <laughs> <laughs> Page one of the coaching manual. I Just love that. Like, going, Alex. Alex is doing wild meetings and you're doing the, the three, two, one squeeze. Right. Out you go, lads. Yeah. My job's done. Alex, you'll, you'll notice I, I haven't been saying anything because it's just uh, unbelievable to hear and all of the yeah. stuff you're talking about is 100%, I think, the way coaching's going, business is going, but but in the right way with, with you know, still having, you know, the, I think... It seems to me that you're engendering kind of obviously people being the best versions of themselves, maintaining standards as a clear frame, framework of like what the expectation is. But obviously within that, how everybody can get better. And yes, obviously the ultimate goal is about winning, but it, it sounds very much like, you know, if you buy into the Alex Arneson system, you know, you're going to come out of it ideally a better person, you know, as well as the team. It's, it seems to me that's what the, the whole the whole goal is. Now, I'm kind of quite envious that I didn't get a chance. And I said this before, when we were in at our, our mutual friend's wedding and I kind of drunkenly approached you and I, I said, you know, I was very, I, one of the regrets, I didn't have the opportunity to work with you because I would come and sit with players and I would be asking them, you know, not just the surface stuff, like you said that, you know, that, that social capital, kind of actually like, what what is it? Like, yeah, it's all well and good bringing a wolf into a meeting and talking about brotherhood and wolf pack stuff, but what what does it mean? How is he communicating? Like, it, you know, what's it like when you're losing as opposed to winning? Because so many people can come out with all this stuff, and especially now, actually, interesting as a head coach in a world where everybody wants to tut and stuff. Can you still be expressive? Can you still have those um, those moments? And I, I'm genuinely kind of amazed, and also. It's, it's your show tonight, not my show. There's plenty of times we've been talking shit. <laughs> oh, my God. Never heard that before. That's not <laughs> I've never heard that. Yeah. It's probably a good thing, mate. We'll be drinking on Sundays, asking yeah. mate to ask me to drink. Wow, well, yeah, fair enough. Go do it. Really enjoy it. Give, us a, give us a glimpse of this week. Does it, does it look after itself? I mean, we started with the aftermath of the weekend. Yeah. Does it run itself? Um, there's a lot. There's a lot that we're not... It's important you don't change too much, uh, just because it's a semi-final week, and I've, and we've got a lot of coaches with a lot of experience. We've been in finals, we've played in finals, Mike Forshaw, Paul Deacon, all of them. Um, so we talked a lot this morning about how we are, how we interact, filtering down to the lads. Now we wanted to. Have a common approach, even though obviously the conversations will be individual, but a common approach in terms of 
Um, yeah, our, our, you know, this is why I was keen to do this, like, because if you start thinking you need to work a bit harder and be a bit more intense, and all of a sudden it, be, it, be, it becomes a bit too much. It's our job to take the fear off them, not to put it on them. So in, in that in that sense, less is more in these kind of weeks. So the content is pretty similar to how it has been, but with the meeting time shortened down, the training time shortened down. Um, we have an understanding of the theme of the conversations we, have, we want to have with the lads. That's been all talked about and planned. Um, and then... We, we, again, we're coming back to this to this week of where are our standards setting victory aside? What do we want each session to look like and attacking every session? Tom Curry is very good on that. He's the most intense rugby knows that I've ever had the privilege of meeting. So, and in with our leader, he, he's very on it in terms of what the sessions need to be and what the feel from the session, what we want to get out of that session. He, yeah, he, I wouldn't say the week runs itself, but every day has its purpose and um, we've picked one day off it's been a good one and I wouldn't say that Tom Curry um, is one of those people that um, says what the coach wants to hear because he doesn't know what he's saying himself let alone like trying to please other people he's not quite sure what's coming out of his head but we interviewed him uh, uh, for yeah. the RPA thing the other day and, and behind it mate I, some of the stuff I don't know you know he said mad people don't know they're mad I don't think yeah, Tom yeah. Curry knows he's mad no he's a real disappointment He's a rugby <laughs> he really is. No, but in that sense, he's a genius. There's very few people who can do what he does and apply himself as he does. Just on him, how good is he relative to how good he can be? You just can't put a, you can't put a, a ceiling on, on people like that. I don't think he's maxed out physically still. So, like, I guess in the traditional sense, he's probably three or four years off his peak for traditional rugby players. And yet, he's one of the world's best players right now. So, I think he can grow in terms of his, he, he's shown different sides to his, his game this year in terms of his attacking ability, hasn't he? And his prowess and ball in hand. Whereas before, he was, I guess, more biased towards a defensive in a back rower. But he's, he's, he's shown that he can have a massive effect both sides of the ball. And that will continue to improve, not just in the tight, but in the wider channels. I think where we're looking to grow him as well is in terms of his leadership skills. Um, and how he gets the best out of those people around him. Very easy for a player who's that in, who's that individually focused. And he said this to me when he came back from England. He says it's changed now, isn't it? It's not just about myself; it's about everyone else as well. And that's 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 big for for someone of his age to take on board and still keep his own personal performances at a level where he's at. So to marry the two up. Uh, Owen's obviously going nowhere in a hurry. But do you think Tom Curry in years to come is a future England captain? He's definitely got the minerals. Definitely got the minerals. I didn't want to make him. I didn't want to make him captain. We had the conversation because I wanted to keep him free. I'm like, you just keep doing what you're doing. You can lead best by your example. But through circumstance, we lost four or five captains. I'm like, Tom, you're gonna have to do it this weekend. <laughs> That's what he said, though. You know, he told us. We asked him because obviously I I hadn't seen the game, but I'd read everywhere that he'd done a great job of leadership, that he'd maintained his kind of unbelievable standards. I'm a huge Tom of, uh, fan of Tom in everything that he he does. Um, but it was he did say, oh, how did the leadership come about? And basically the story was that everybody else in the team was either dead or, or injured. <laughs> and you were like, you were like looking around. Apparently he was there. And it was like a crowd, you're like looking around. And he was like waving. It was like, <laughs> oh, mate, listen, Tom, uh, sorry, mate, but you, do, you, do you want to be captain? Just don't say anything. Just lead by example. And he was like, okay, okay. And that's basically what happened. Yeah, and he's brilliant. He's brilliant at it. He's brilliant at it. Um, it, it was funny thing because Bro came back a couple of weeks. Josh Beaumont um, came back into the side and made him captain. Uh, and... Barnes was there before the game and Faf de Klerk stood next to me and Bo was there and he goes, oh, I just thought you were going to be captain, Faf. And Faf looks at me and I'm like, well, do you want to be captain? And he goes, no, I'm not bothered. I'm like, well, there you go. Like, the, the, it's a title. The, it, it is a title because as you know, Tins, you have a captain of defence, a captain of attack, you have your scrum leader, your line-out leader, you know, maybe someone who talks about the breakdown. It, 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 it takes all sorts to direct the team, but it takes a special individual to pull in and call him that person to give the team direction. That's what Tom's really good at. Has Ben Curry's time come for it for England? I hope so. I really do. He's, he's, 
He's rating himself as a, a 7 out of 10 at the moment, rating himself as a 7 out of 10. So there's probably a third more in him. He's not good at fractions. Just under a third. <laughs> uh, that's exciting. Genetically identical, exactly the same application. Smart guy, just as invested. So why wouldn't he achieve what his brother's achieved? If it's about nurturing nature, they've got the nature, it just needs the nurture. So why, 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 I think they're foolish not to include him because he's going to make the same rise if he gets the same tuition. Mega. And come Saturday, or come, is it Saturday or Sunday, the semi-final? Which one's yours? Saturday. 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 So come Saturday, the final thing you will say to the team will be fueled by what happened last weekend or smile, enjoy it. It's there to be taken. Um, t- Tom, Tom said something like, yeah, Tom said something today and he's like, it's, we've got to see, although we, we now know the truth behind the belief that we can win, there's a truth there that we can, right? So that, that fortifies you somewhat. And I think we can take that, but Tom said it's a different game. Like you, you can't live off the back of the last game. You can't, with all the lessons that we've had, we, we might be able to take, but we have to see him as a, not a different opposition, but a totally different game with its own challenges. And I think that was, again, very smart from, from Tom. So it's important that we black box what happened last week and we approach this game with somewhere near the same intensity we started, but we're able to maintain that suicide pace, as I called it before, for 80 minutes. Um, I never thought I'd say this, and I, I do get dizzy outside the M25, but... Yeah. You've got the remarkable achievement of making sale lovable at the moment and like followable and interesting. And you, there's a sort of will to win following in behind you from people who've never, I've never been as far north as, as, as Manchester. Is that something you're conscious of? And is that something that putting sale on the map and getting a wider buy in is on your to do list? Or is it totally incidental? And actually, I've got far better things to be getting on with. Do you know what I mean, well, though? Uh, look. When it was said, do you see yourselves as a focal point for rugby in the Northwest? When I first turned up, I'm like, wow, no, who does? You've got to be some kind of narcissistic egomaniac, can't you? To see yourself and the club as a focal point for a region. Um, but I guess, you know, if not us, then, then who? And if, if, if not now, then when? Like, of course, it, we, we want people to be... We want people to, it's not even about following, it's just about respect right now. I don't think this team's been respected. I don't think it's been given the credit for the efforts they've had for the last few years and they missed out on that recognition of effort last year in the semi-final. And this, for most of those lads, is about earning some of that recognition back. And along the way, if we pick up a, a few followers because we're the underdogs, because we like playing the 13, 14 men, then, then it is a benefit, but we, we do appreciate all the support that we're getting and, and the goodwill, and it does make a difference. It makes a difference for them, and it's, it warms your heart a little bit. Yeah. Um, we are going to watch with great make, interest. Make the North great again. Up the North! <laughs> North. Northern boys love gravy. Um, <laughs> Alex, it's been absolutely fascinating. I mean, genuinely, genuinely, one of the most enjoyable shows I think we've ever done, and there are more T-shirts that we can make out of this, and I think yeah. Umbro are going to know what to do with Final thoughts, Tin Task. I mean, we talk about Wayne Pivak and a man who you want to follow and play for. I mean, you know Alex better than most, but how much would you love to put your boots on and dive yeah, in it's, underneath it's, him? It's just completely different, isn't it? I mean, it's from where I, I've always experienced and started to how, you know, Hask's been banging on for numerous years around the, the development of not just your body. It's not a physical being that just turns up. There is a a whole soul and mental capacity that goes with it and why are winners so good? Why can Usain Bolt eat chicken McNuggets and be so relaxed and high-fiving all these guys who takes his kit but then as soon as he gets on all fours the may it switches on and he bang, he's gone. And that is something that hasn't been tapped in well enough and it's great to see people like Al who um, had that mentality anyway when he was a player. I was, you know, I saw how good he was at schoolboy level, and and when he when he turned professional, and he had that taken away, and he's now making other people's dreams come true, which is brilliant. Oh, no. Off. 
Yeah, I mean, look, I, I said it. I said it at the top of the show, you know, and we're, we're always very complimentary to our guests as well. We wouldn't have many back, but <laughs> I, you know, I'm not paying. Lip, we're not paying lip service to it. You know, I, I genuinely. You know, as Tim said, I feel very strongly about um, personal development, about how 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 to get better, and the journey of of trying to improve yourself and be a better person across the way in whatever activity is a is a thing never never achieved, and you should keep working that. And in rugby, I, I think you know I was an early adopter of kind of the psychological side, and so many people will, will go and do anything other than speak, open up, talk, look for development, and I think the the old belief system has to finish and what what Alex has done um you know and as I said I don't know him very well I've got to know him a bit better in the last uh, few years but you know his reputation with the players he works with the you know the kind of level-headed directness fun um well thought out but you know and a good all-round good person where the guys have a lot of fun and stuff it, it sp spoke for itself and, it, and it's something that I would have loved to work with I think he would have made me a better person I already I kind of offline want to ask him where he's getting all his quotes from because I've never had someone pull so many quotes and references out. You must be reading like, <laughs> I, I, like a book a day. Yeah. No, I don't. Are you? Are you? I was going to ask that one question. Go ask. Are you a voracious reader? You must be like on the on the the journey all the time. No, um, I'd love to. I'd love to have the time. I will. I will in the next month. I'll definitely get down to a bit, but I'm, I'm more about escaping from it when I can. Um, finding ways to escape, uh, to yeah, to, to get a bit of space from it because that's that's what that's what gives you creativity, for me. Otherwise, you become blinkered in in the task when you start to you take the blinkers off. Things seem easy, don't they? Seems fun. It'll be fun. But I, I mean, look, I, I, I wish it was yeah. switch off. I, also, can yeah, you I mean, look, make I, sure I, you record? You, the, record the wife bring you back down to earth after all that compliment. Send that in. A couple of times she's in the background, you can't see her. She's like, ah, don't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, I, I, I mean, look, I, yeah. I, I said, I, I genuinely want to see how, how, you know, how successful you can be. So I think you're, Alex is right. You know, there's like a real kind of momentum um you know we wish you all the, all the best of luck and, and i'd love one day to come and be like a fly on the wall and just see how it see how it does it and i promise not to put anything on social media but what i want to see is that rugby is a cruel mistress rugby is a cruel mistress and i want to see yeah. 10 years from now with a few premierships maybe some international work do you become a wizened old miser who goes back to the, the, the dark days or are you still fresh face quoting philosophers and great minds or are you like fucking shut up lads just get on with it for fuck's sake well, I'll, I'll answer that with a quote there you go in the immortal words of morrissey time will prove everything there you go we'll see that is one up on taylor swift i feel very <laughs> relieved that we've managed to finish with morrissey and not Britney spears morrissey's a legend absolutely um Al, thank you very much indeed. If we could book Hask onto your increasing self-awareness course, we'd absolutely pay 10 times over to have that done. Um, I never thought I'd say this. We've always had a bit of a soft spot for Exeter because we love the way they go about this. But I, I genuinely wish you and your team all the very, very best this weekend. It's going to be a hell of a battle and may the best team win. And it would it would be a hell of a story if you do it. I hope you give it all you've got. Um, Will you come back and have another chat with us another time soon? There are so many other things we'd love to touch on, but I think you've got other things far more important to be doing. We're going to say thank you very, very much indeed for diving in and good luck, go get them. It's been absolutely intriguing, fascinating, and we wish you all the best. Thanks. Fantastic. Thanks, mate. All the very best and we'll see you on the other side. What a man. You know, I mean, Jenny, when you said Wayne Pivat, I'd love to play for him. I mean... I never could, never did, never never was able to. But even I'd put on some boots and just to tap into what what, what potentially he could do with a an absolute amateur like me. That that sort of belief stuff is unbelievably powerful. It's, it's funny that it's funny though what has to say at the end is that that was Dean Ryan for those three years that Gloucester played at a great different level, and the fourth year he was right, right, I'm changing this. It was like no, fucking do that, fucking do that. <laughs> All the work that you've done over three years suddenly disappeared. Um, and he got a worse result. So, but I think he's gone back to being a bit more philosophical about how he deals with it. Yeah, it is interesting though. I'd be fascinated to know. I, I bet you, you know how Exeter have been. And I read somewhere the other day that our, our Exeter sort of moving into that that zone now. You know, there were there was such a followable 
this means nothing to, to the players and to results. But it's an interesting sort of concept, which is that, you know, they, they, Exeter was so easy to follow and now they are establishing success at the top end. People sort of want to see a new challenger. Yeah. Well, they always do, don't they? That's the and I think of... Bristol and Sale have both got a real fall in behind them because yeah. it looks a lot of fun to be a part of for both of them. Yeah, it's going to be interesting about the Bristol. I think Sale are more set up to go and win those big one-off games at the moment than, than Bristol are. I think Bristol will always still struggle uh, because they play such an expensive game. It's sometimes you need to be have that nuggety defensive Tom Curry just hitting, stealing ball. And that's they're the games where Bristol have struggled, haven't they, when people have been able to gnaws them off. So I think their I think their tool set is is is, is built for this game on the weekend obviously they were what 19 points up at one point um and next to showed why they were champions but yeah I think... are they going to do it I you can't ask him that because obviously the answer is yes of course are they going to do it um because rob baxter ramped right, up the pressure on exeter off the back of it it's yeah, got, I, I mean I, that I, is as yeah. prem semi-finals go they're both brilliant games this year with um, I, obviously I Bristol think... Quinns, but this is just Titan. But I tell you, who won't be enjoying it is um, Warren Gatland. Yeah, I think it's going to be you know exactly what Al said. It's how you can mentally going into the game. You're everyone's going to be saying next to I've got that mental because they they've clawed their way back and done what they needed to do to win. Now it's if you can shift all that of what happened in the second half, or whatever. What what. The processes that got you there in the first half, you know, Alex t- talked about not bringing on people at the right time because he was caught into the game. Now, if you change those little bits and pieces and get right on the day, then you you come out and win that game. So, uh, yeah, fascinating for sure. Yeah, I will say that someone like Alex Arneson, because of his the clearer emotional intelligence he has, and that, like, you can see, you know, even when you ask the question, like, what will your final words be for the changing room? And he pauses yeah. and it's like, you know, part of you knows, is he, you know, has he been working something on all, all week? There will be a theme with the week, I would imagine. From what I've heard from players, again, I'm looking through an opaque window, so I couldn't, I couldn't tell exactly. But I believe there will be a theme specific to the final it, while maintaining that kind of, this is just another game. And that will be the final words. And he kind of thought, with a man that's con- the his mind smile. is constantly working... Yeah, it's the, but with a mind that's constantly working, that emotion, somebody that could pull an emotional reaction, which is what required to win, you know, semi-finals and finals, and that will raise a team above the opposition. If anybody could do it, he can do it. You know, Sean Edwards back in the day could do it. You know, you see, you know, you see Warren Gatland with Wales and Alliance and his coaching staff, they could do it. You know, I, I know obviously Exeter have kind of thrived off that general emotional well-being because they all have such a great time. They love Rob Baxter. Everyone, they love everything about it. Alex Arnes, I think, think could tap into an emotional reaction, which would then, you know, take them ahead. And I think, I think they hundred percent could do it. But I, I love the, the the social story to it. That's exactly what you said about why do people love it? It's not necessarily the purity of the game. Yes, there are some mm. nauseas who love that, but it is the. Well, so-and-so has just taken over that job. He was so successful at Saracens. Was he the unseen hero of Saracens? Now he's at Sale. Fuck me, Sale are doing really well. Yeah. Exeter, they won everything. They're definitely going to win. Oh, wait a minute. It was a little wobble. Bristol playing champagne rugby. Quinns. Quinns didn't get everyone a chance. They sacked their coach halfway through the season. They can't make it. Oh, my God. And, like, this is why they love it. And I I, I think it is. I think this crescendo is, 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 is building. And I think Sale can 100% do it. And I think if they did it, they could go on and crack the, crack the whole thing. What story that would be? People by people, don't they? That was another quote. I'm, I've been in, I've been infused and affected. By <laughs> yeah, yeah, one of the great. Horror I feel like I don't have definitely enough quotes. quotes. Definitely buying a book of quotes before we next game. Yeah, we yeah. need to up our game. I don't out, have to... quoting. But you know, you, you know, it's with, with interesting. Mask. Yours are never quite as inspirational uh, as Alex Sanders, no. but you're you're trying. <laughs> um, what a, what a man. And what a job he's doing at Sale. And the very, I didn't thought, I didn't think I'd say this in a hurry, but good luck. To the Sale Sharks this weekend. It's going to be absolutely titanic in the Prem semi-final against the Exeter Chiefs. Good luck to Briz against Quinns as well. Um, may the best teams win, as we said. Just before we go, we'd like to say a very big and a very quick thank you to City Index, who are the global provider of spread betting, CFD and Forex trading. They have hosted us in their six-week demo trading competition. Um, you may have been following on our socials, our weekly leaderboards. It's been a little bit tough for uh, Tins and I. Unbelievably, our man Hass came out on top 
uh, certainly out of the three of us and for a few of the weeks um, you were running as the front runner. But unfortunately, it was Alan Davis. Congratulations to he who took the win. And very generously, City Index have awarded Alan with a winning prize of 20 grand, which he's going to be donating to the Enke- Encephalitis, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, Encephalitis Society and the Saracens Foundation two causes very close to his heart. So well done, Alid, and thank you to City Index for that. On top of this, we held a competition to win a signed Saracens match ball and a playing jersey as well, as well as signed merch from us at the Good, the Bad and the Rugby. And I'm pleased to announce that Jamie Permond is the lucky winner. Well done to you, Jamie. Your prizes are in the post. And once again, a massive thanks to City Index for a really enjoyable uh, demo trading competition. The three of us have certainly learned a thing or two. Always looking to upskill in that regard. Well done to Alid and well done to Jamie on your respective prizes. That is it for the Good, the Bad and the Rugby for this week. Our thanks and best wishes to Alex Sanderson and Sale for the playoffs, as we said. Anything interesting in the diary this week, Tins? Uh, Royal Ascot tomorrow. Oh, yes. Um, and then Good. I've actually got some gigs this week. Two, Stop. Two gi- I'm, in L- I'm in London. Um, what else? No, that was it. Had a little uh, little trip down to Devs at the weekend, which yeah. was nice. Did you win your Cubs? Did I win my? Uh, did I take the Cubs? No. No. Did you win? Were you playing Cubs when we spoke? I did. Yes, we did play Cub. Yeah. And I lost to actually uh, two former rugby players who I won't give them the credit of naming. Good. Right. Get over that. Half there's <laughs> always something going on with you. Uh, I was actually looking I've got a, a stu- music production day uh, a talk on mental health and maybe some deer stalking I mean all in all just a very diverse very diverse and random week with nothing to nothing to write home about sadly actually one of the other things I did was um, uh, I supported uh, Jack Fleckney in his world uh, record attempt for pull-ups um, at Franklin's Gardens it was great that, you know uh, all the Saints boys came back did a little DJ set they had 12 separate DJs throughout the day I did 9 to 10 heat Unfortunately, he got over 3,000, which is ridiculous. Um, and he was going for a record of 5,500, but he had a bit of an injury going into it and he just was unable. But he kept going till four in the morning. And Tom Wood, the madman, came back from the game with a broken nose. And Standard Woody started joining in and ended up doing 700 with him until four oh in the morning. God. I mean, I didn't. Post game. I know. I didn't. Post. So basically, I was DJing. All the Saints boys started. Woody was like, all right, Hask. And I was like, yeah. How you doing? Had a drink. And I could see him watching Jack, and Jack was like doing amazing, but he was sort of struggling a bit. So Woody got on with him and, and did the pull up with it. They would, they would basically have to do two every minute for the world record. Two a minute, and basically he would do two, Jack would do two, he would do two, and he stayed. I, le- I left at 1.30 in the morning. He, Woody stayed till 4.30 and carried on doing it. And Jack, I think, called it at five in the morning. It was like, I can't carry on, I'm in too much pain. So carried on for the money. They raised over 50 grand for, for charity, for the Saints Foundation. Um, what a machine. He's already got the ski erg world record. And he had the uh, and he was going for the pull-up one. It's insane. And I called Woody up the next day. And he was like, mate, my hands don't work. My shoulders don't work. Um, so and, and Jack, poor Jack, obviously, I think we'll probably come back and have another go. But what an effort. I, I, was, I felt bad. I had a bit of a like, moment when I was DJing, having a few beers. I was like, oh, what have I done with my life? There's a guy like raising money for charity, like really fit, and I'm there steaming up, mixing you know, rhythm of the dancer in. <laughs> Jack at 5,000, Tom Wood at 700, post the Premiership game. Tens, how many yeah. did you, I reckon I contributed seven to the cause, maybe yeah. six, yeah. before yeah. injury would have gotten away. How many I did one. They asked me. They asked me to do well. I did. I managed to do forty six in three sets the other day with like limited rest, and I almost died after. I couldn't pull myself up. But the, the equipment people, Wolverson, who did the equipment, said, "Oh, James, will you do a couple of pull ups?" Obviously, I had a couple of beers. I was like pull ups, of course, I did pull ups. So I did the whole like standard pull ups. Then I did my legs flat out in front of me. Then I did the stairs. Then I did the cross and down. And there's a great photo of Jack in the background, just looking like this. You fucking what a dickhead! And I was like, I don't think you can post that. He looked really unhappy that I, well, he was like tired. I was doing all this shit, like climbing up, moonwalking down them. Yeah, so I, I learned my lesson, but I couldn't. I couldn't resist showing off as per usual. So unlike you to miss the point of the story and the moment, and just to come in from a complete right angle. Well, there is what there is yeah. even worse than me. Martin O'Fire DJed in the day. So Martin O'Fire turned up, obviously legend, legendary rugby league player, legend of a bloke DJ. <laughs> There's a video of him. He got on the pull-up bar, but not the spare ones, the one Jack was using, and is doing one-armed pull-ups. 
And it's like, and it was like, yeah, it's really good, but it's like, you know, Jack's on a time limit, like he's going for a world record. And Martin, I was like, ah, ah, ah. And I was like, Martin, great, could you get the fuck out of the way? There's a world record. And Jack's like laughing, but sort of like looking at his time. And it was amazing. Laughing, but not. Thank you for watching, thank you for listening. Well done, Jack. See you next time. Bye bye.